Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on the emotional and social challenges experienced by families living with food allergy. I am Ranjit Danjal, Vice President, Marketing, Communications and Engagement with Food Allergy Canada, and I have with me Dr. Joanne Gillespie. Before we get started, I wanted to note a few housekeeping items. All participants are muted so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them in the chat question box throughout the webinar. Um, so we can try to get to as many questions at the end as we can. The webinar will be recorded and shared on uh, foodallergycanada.ca afterwards. So if you would like to watch it again, uh, we welcome that. And also after the webinar, you will receive a short survey. Uh, just if you could take a few minutes to complete it as it provides us with great feedback, uh, that would be appreciated. Now, I would like to introduce Canadian psychologist, Dr. Joanne Gillespie. She is part of the Pediatric Health Psychology Service at the IWK Centre. She's also an associate with Dr. Kathy Hubley, Carothers Counseling and Psychological Services, and a clinical associate in the Department of Psychology at Dalhousie University. She specializes in health psychology and has expertise working with preschoolers, school-aged children, adolescents, and families. So over to you, Dr. Gillespie. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to speak on such an important topic. I'm really pleased to be here um, and looking forward to the next hour or so. So the objectives for today's talk uh, want to summarize the potential impact that food allergies can have on families talk a lot about uh, anxiety because this is a really important emotion for us to understand, especially uh, within the area of food allergy. We're going to talk about some strategies that people can use to reduce the emotional and social impacts of the food allergy and then talk about what indicators there might be that more support would be helpful and if that's the case how to go ahead and access those resources. So we know that food allergy means that many things need to be adapted both at home and away from home. And so today I really wanna focus on the diagnosed child, but also on caregivers and siblings. So really looking at taking a broad systems approach and looking at how food allergy becomes an entire uh, family affair. So if we think about what impact there is on caregivers, we know that food is a necessary requirement of life. We can't take a break from eating. And so families really need to be constantly vigilant in order to keep children safe. We know that food allergies can be expensive. And when I say expensive, we're talking both time, so doing grocery shopping, label reading, food prep, um, and also money. So there needs to be time taken off to attend appointments. And then there's often costs that are associated with attending medical visits. There are increased responsibilities about food. Again, additional planning and prep preparation and disruption in many daily activities. So things like school or travel, going out to eat in restaurants or participating in extracurriculars outside of the home all bring new challenges. In terms of relational strain, uh, we know that food allergy can be an additional source of stress in relationships. Uh, and that's something that's seen throughout the chronic illness literature. I think it's extra challenging in food allergy though, because if there are uh, romantic relationships that do dissolve, it's going to increase stress in a potentially already stressful situation. Uh, there's going to be disruption in family routines and activities. And then we also have the potential for new partners and new children being introduced into the family, uh, which means new people that are going to have to be educated about food allergy. And there's going to have to be development of trust uh, in order to leave the child who has the food allergy with a different caregiver. So really, I think the take home message is parenting a child who has a food allergy is stressful. And I feel like I'm singing to the choir, but really just wanna make sure that people understand that you are heard and validated. And there's lots in the research literature um, and in our clinical work that points to how stressful this can be. So if you're feeling overwhelmed sometimes, if this brings on some stress and anxiety, that makes a lot of sense. So I just wanna make sure people know that that's heard. So let's get right to what can you do. So these are ideas of what you can do for yourself. So first of all, it's important to identify what areas of burden there might be and ask for help. So do some investigating and try to determine what parts about managing the food allergy are the most stressful for you. 
That way you can think about whether or not there's some tasks that can be shared or delegated to someone else. Or perhaps if you're taking more responsibility in relation to the food allergy management, then maybe some of the other day-to-day -day tasks um, with the children or in the household, they can be shared or passed along to another member of the family. We also want to keep an eye on what the triggers are for your stress and anxiety. So once you recognize you're feeling stress, trying to reflect on how did you get there? What caused that? Because we know if we can identify the tri triggers, then it can prevent the stress the next time. Or if we can't prevent it, then we can hopefully mitigate the impact that it has. And once the triggers are known, we can do some problem solving, we can figure out what needs to be changed. And preventing, reducing, problem solving, those things are all active kinds of activities. They're very task focused, and they tend to be more helpful for people than just worrying passively where we don't actually move towards making change. I'd also encourage you to really take a look at your thoughts and try to identify ones that get you stuck. So we all have automatic thoughts. We have things that pop into our head and they often are not true. And so we have to step back and kind of think about whether or not the thought that we're having, is it true and is it helpful or is it unrealistic and unhelpful? So just to give you an example, if a thought that you're having about food allergies is something like, my child's food allergies ruin everything, that's a lot different than saying something to yourself like, food allergies get in the way sometimes, but they're manageable. So again, we're not talking about positive thoughts, but we're trying to find ones that are unhelpful, unrealistic, and then shifting those. It's also important to look for opportunities where you can connect with other people that really understand food allergies and the uh, family environment and how stressful it can be. Remember to take good care of yourself. We know self-care is important and it can also be really difficult, uh, but thinking about sleeping and your diet and finding opportunities for exercise and relaxation. But beyond that, also looking at your relationships and whether or not those are supportive or if those are more a source of stress. And then also looking for ways where you can fill your cup, so to speak. So things that you enjoy, things that help you to feel really good about yourself. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the oxygen mask on the airplane analogy. That's a really common one that I'm sure many people have heard. The idea, though, is that when you're on an airplane, there's an announcement before takeoff that talks about if the cabin pressure drops during the flight, passengers are reminded to secure their own mask before they attempt to help a child or someone else. And so we need to really remember that if we're not doing well, then it's really hard to help others. And so often one of the best things we can do as parents is to take care of ourselves so then we can be the best parent to our children. I wanted to make sure that we talk about siblings uh, because we're taking a family approach, as I mentioned, but really siblings tend to be a population that get less attention in the chronic illness literature. They're kind of the forgotten group, um, but it's really important that we're considering all members of the family. So when I say uh, not a lot of research across chronic illness, that would be very true for allergy as well. So there's very limited work that's been done with siblings specifically. Uh, there's one study that I have here that was done a few years back a Danish study, uh, families where peanut allergy was present, and they took um, the opportunity to speak with brothers and sisters of children that have peanut allergy to really learn what that was like for them. So the themes that were coming across, three major ones were identified. One was the feeling of the need to protect the sibling, so really taking responsibility for the brother or sister's safety. A lot of worry, concern that uh, their sibling might be exposed to an allergen. And then a real threat about fear, so that idea that they might lose their sibling because of an allergic reaction. So let's think about what caregivers can do for siblings. How can we help brothers and sisters? So you'll notice the graphic that I have on this screen is communicate. And really, um, the key point of all of these bullets is about communication. So we want to make sure that we're discussing the concerns that other children might have. We're inviting them to ask us questions. And I think that's important because it's sending the message that everything's open for discussion and there's no topic off limits. So even if it's something the child doesn't want to talk about today, they know they have the opportunity to do that at another time in the future. 
We want to ask open-ended questions. So instead of asking something where you're going to get a yes or a no, and that's the end of the discussion, you want to think about ways to ask questions where children are going to elaborate and give you a bit more information. We also have to remember that our job as parents is not always to fix the problem. And I know as a parent, that's a really hard one because it's difficult to see the people that we love the most in the world struggling. But really, it's understanding what's going on and validating their experience that can be so helpful in those kinds of situations. So we want to think about labeling and validating emotions and even the hard ones we have to really take note of. So if your child is talking about being worried about their sibling, that's probably a easy one to validate because you can really relate to that worry. But if they're describing things like feeling jealous or frustrated, they're resentful because of their brother and sister, that's much harder to have an open conversation about um, because it probably leads to some of your own self-talk in terms of how could they think that, they're being selfish, and we're really missing the opportunity to find out what's going on and discuss that with our other children. Also remember that we want to provide information. Um, children are amazing, and if we don't give them information, often they'll create their own story or understanding about things, and many times that's not accurate. So we want to give them information um, that we know to be true, uh, appropriate for the child's age, and we really want to work on focusing on things that can be done, things that can be controlled. So reassurance about a safety plan, letting them know that um, there's a plan in place should something happen and there are things that can be managed in order to keep their brother and sister safer. Generally, we want to try and carve out one-on-one -on -one time for all of the children in the family. Um, and again, as a parent, I know that's easier said than done. Uh, time is a really uh, difficult commodity sometimes to get extra of. Uh, but even if we're spending small amounts of time doing things one-on-one -on -one with each child, it can have huge benefits. You also want to think about how you can maintain routines um, and expectations about behavior across the household. So we know that kids thrive on consistency and routine. And if they can predict what's expected of them, then they tend to do a lot better. So having rules and expectations, it helps children to feel safe. And if the same rules are in place throughout the household, it also helps to keep things more fair and can reduce resentment among siblings as well. So let's talk a little bit about the child who's actually been diagnosed with the food allergy. So again, we know when children are quite young, the burden is mostly on caregivers. So it's parents who are doing a lot of the planning and the management, but there's still going to be changes in developmentally appropriate activities. So things like going to play dates or doing sleepovers, uh, going to camp or birthday parties, special events at school or really any activities away from home are all going to retire, uh, require some additional work. As children get older, um, they have more awareness of the risk of their food allergy. They have a better understanding about how serious it is. And then they're also developmentally starting to understand about death. And so that really brings on a potential for an increase in anxiety as they're learning about how serious their condition could potentially be. So for anxiety, typically um, we're seeing challenges with separation anxiety, so where children are having a hard time doing things away from their parents, um, but also some increased social anxiety. So that fear of being rejected by peers or fear of being isolated within their peer group can also make some children feel quite anxious. Usually um, the uh, fears are specific to the allergy, but for some children, they become more generalized and we see broader anxiety challenges um, separate from or in addition to those related to food allergy. And then we also have to mention bullying uh, because that's a really important thing that we're aware of for children generally, but certainly within food allergy, uh, we really want to keep an eye on this. So we know that bullying is a common experience for children with food allergy and about a third or one out of three children are reporting some kind of bullying. So that can be things like teasing or taunting, uh, isolating children, statements of resentment, it's not fair, we can't do this because of the child. Uh, relational conflict where there's uh, talking behind children's back or spreading rumors and then also physical intimidation where there's threats with the actual food allergies uh, to try and uh, scare a child or produce harm. 
And again, we want to really keep an eye on bullying because we know that it's associated with reduced quality of life and it can have sig significant impacts. So we want to be checking in with our children. Uh, most bu bullying happens away from parents, away from adults. Um, and so school, the playground can be a common place. And so we want to be checking in. We're not there all the time. And so we have to be having those conversations and asking those questions and really trying to understand what's happening. As children get older, uh, different challenges tend to emerge. And so we're going to talk a little bit about adolescence because we know some different things can happen for this age group. So through adolescence, we see increasing amounts of time without parents and spending more times with uh, friends and peers. And we know that's developmentally appropriate. We want kids to be uh, more independent and develop, develop their autonomy. But it can also cause increased family conflict. So we have youth that are trying to be more independent and take more responsibility for their self-care. And we have parents who are worried, especially in relation to food allergy and trying to control the environment. And so that can be a real source of push and pull between teens and their parents. We also know there's an increased risk of bullying with adolescents specifically. Um, and so again, this isn't something that's just younger kids being kids. It continues throughout um, development. And so we want to keep an eye on it. Uh, there was one North American study done a few years ago where they asked uh, 11 to 22 year olds online about their experiences with bullying. And in this particular uh, study, 71% of the youth were talking about being teased in relation to their food allergy. And almost half of them reported episodes where other people had tried to make them eat a food allergen. So again, a real concern and something we certainly want to be aware of and ask about. There's also challenges um, specific to the development, um, the period of adolescence, and so uh, potential substance use, substance misuse, and then also increases in physical contact opportunities with dating and kissing and intimacy. So again, conversations and awareness, that's really important. Risk taking is one of the hallmarks of adolescence. Um, there is this phenomenon where youth feel invincible and there's biology that supports why that happens in terms of the frontal lobe of their brain and how it's developing. But the challenge with food allergy is that that kind of invincibility feeling can lead to um, the idea that nothing bad is going to happen to them, which results in potentials for not being adherent with doing the things they need to do to be safe. So not reading labels, not caring their EpiPen, not asking questions or actually eating things that they know they shouldn't because they feel like nothing's going to happen anyway. So that brings with it an increased risk of anaphylaxis and certainly a lot of uh, stress for parents. Then I have anxiety on here again. So with youth, it's that idea of fear often related to the food allergen and that avoidance of situations in order to try to decre decrease that anxiety. So what we can do uh, for children or teens who have the food allergy, we really have to think about understanding what are the reasons for whatever challenges might be present. So for example, if there's non-adherence, if a, a teenager is not carrying their EpiPen as much as they should be, then we really have to understand why is that happening. So is it a lack of knowledge? That's important because some children who are diagnosed when they're really young, haven't been given information as they get older. It's just been assumed they understand. And so sometimes it's a knowledge deficit or a skill deficit, and so that can be taught. We also have to find out, are there social concerns? Are there things that make the youth feel different? Because we know that that's going to have an impact on their behavior, because for teenagers especially, it's fitting in and feeling like you're like everyone else, that's really important. So anything that makes you feel different or to stand out from your peers can be a challenge. We want to remember uh, that we're learning what's going on and really working hard not to fall into the lecturing trap. So when things are challenging, we tend to like to give lots of information because we want to make sure that people hear us. So we might speak louder and more sternly. And really, the information that you're probably discussing with respect to um, adherence specifically is not something that the youth hasn't heard before. So it's really trying to figure out what's going on instead of just giving the information without having that background knowledge. 
One of my favorite quotes um, from Stephen Covey is that we really want to listen to understand, not respond. And I think sometimes in many different contexts, we forget that and we're more worried about what we're going to say next instead of understanding where the other person's coming from. Think about building disease management skills. And so this is something that's happening throughout development. So it's something that can start very young in small amounts uh, so that children can feel more confident. And then as they get older, they already have those abilities and we can build on those. Also think about problem solving and goal setting. So when there are challenges, when there are things to work on, we want to try and involve the child or the youth in the planning and the decision making. So they're really part of this collaborative process and what they're working on uh, or problem solving about is something that's important to them. So in psychology, we like to talk about SMART goals. So you'll see my graphic on this uh, particular slide that talks about um, the different um, letters for the SMART acronym and what they mean. So really trying to think about things that are specific and measurable, things that can be attained, uh, they're important to the person setting the goal, and they have a time limit on them so we know what we're working towards and we can see whether or not we've been successful or we need to kind of change things and work at it from a different angle. I also want to encourage you to really think about the positives. When we're worried, when we're stressed, when something's not going well, we tend to lose sight of some of the things that are going well. And people benefit, children benefit from praise, sometimes from extrinsic, extrinsic rewards um, to motivate them in order to, to realize they're being recognized and valued. And so we want to try and figure out what are the small pieces even of things that are going well and how can we acknowledge those. We also want to continue to check in about social and peer relationships. Again, given uh, challenges with bullying we know in this particular population, we want to keep an eye on what's going on at school and away from home. If there's children all of a sudden that aren't being invited uh, anymore or your child's not talking about that particular uh, child, what are the reasons for that? Is it kind of a normal thing developmentally? Sometimes kids grow apart or has there been some kind of um, disruption in that relationship? that needs to be addressed specifically in relation to their allergy. And then again, we really want to talk about anxiety. So if you're recognizing anxiety, then we need to figure out how to address that. And those are the kinds of referral, referrals that I tend to receive. Um, and certainly it's something that I feel really important to address within food allergy. So my plan is to spend uh, the rest of uh, our time together talking about anxiety and then give you some information about what it looks like from a psychologist's perspective in terms of treatment uh, and then also talk about some resources if that's something that you feel would be helpful for your family to access. So you'll notice in bold, I have the word normal. And I think that's really important because this is something that we all experience. And anxiety is important because it gives us information about potential danger. And then we want to try and avoid something that's dangerous. So it's adaptive, it helps to keep us safe. And so it's really important that we have some anxiety. When we have that physiological response, when we perceive something as threatening and we want to avoid it, then we have a, our nervous system that kicks in and we have the fight, flight, or freeze response. So we see changes like our heart beating faster, our muscles become more tense, we may change our breathing, it becomes faster, we start to hold our breath, uh, we might feel lightheaded or dizzy, and then there's all kinds of GI changes that happen as well. So people may have the proverbial butterflies in their stomach, they may feel nauseous, they may get diarrhea, all kinds of different things that are telling us that our body is having some kind of a reaction to a perceived threat. Because it is a perceived threat, we have the potential for false alarms. So something that is physically dangerous, that brings on anxiety, will feel the exact same way as something that is perceived as dangerous, but may in fact not actually be. So the false alarms is having that anxiety reaction when there's not an actual threat. It's a problem when anxiety starts to take control. And so with children, I'll try to externalize it. So the anxiety is something that we're working against. And anxiety is a problem when it makes decisions for people. So you're doing something because of your anxiety, not because you want to or you don't want to. It causes interference in tasks that you need to do or want to do, and it causes distress. It's upsetting for you. 
So what I think is particular, particularly interesting about food allergy um, is when we look at the symptoms of an allergic reaction, and these are things, of course, that you're aware of, we can superimpose some of the symptoms of anxiety. So if you notice at the bottom of this slide, we're really focusing on difficulties or changes in breathing, feelings of panic or impending doom, GI changes with uh, stomach upset or vomiting, nausea, and then that feeling of being dizzy or lightheaded. And these kinds of things are similar both in an anaphylactic sorry, anaphylactic reaction um, or in the initial stages of an allergic reaction and when we're having an experience of anxiety. It's also challenging because we need some anxiety, especially in food allergy. It's adaptive and it's protective. By being vigilant and keeping an eye on things, it helps to keep people safe. And so we don't want to take that away. At the same time, the threat is always present. And so we can't stop eating and we can't take food out of our lives. And so the threat is always going to be there. The challenge is when there's over-responding or under-responding by families, those tend to result in poorer outcomes. So I'm gonna show you, this is called the bell curve or the normal distribution. And on the, along the bottom of the slide, you'll see anxiety related to food allergy, and then across the side is quality of life. And most people fall in that middle region the uh, green zone, I've labeled it here, as adaptive behavior. So we have some stress or anxiety, people have an accurate understanding about how to manage the food allergy, what they need to do. They're being appropriately vigilant, they're taking um, the needed precautions, and there's no significant functional impairment as a result of doing all those things. But then we have the other extremes of this distribution. So on the left-hand side, we have risk-taking behavior um, where there's not enough stress or anxiety. Perhaps there's an inaccurate understanding about risk. People are not being vigilant enough. And as a result, um, they're doing things that put them at risk. And because of that, uh, have the potential for more frequent, more frequent reactions. On the other side, we have um, the extreme opposite. So we have people who are very stressed, very anxious. They also don't have an inaccurate, sorry, they also have an inaccurate understanding uh, because they're potentially avoiding things that they don't need to because they feel like they need to do that in order to be safe. They're overly vigilant, overly cautious, and because of that, they're missing out on activities that they don't need to miss out on in order to be safe. So on that side of things, I've labeled um, impairment or distress. So ideally, we want people falling in the center of that distribution, again, with some anxiety, some stress, not on the far left where there's risk taking and not on the far right where there's going to be impairment. It's really about finding a balance. Um, and if you were seeing me here in Halifax, you would see me having both hands in front of me and kind of going back and forth with the left and the right and talking about balancing all of the important things we have. So we want to figure out how do we balance doing things to stay healthy with doing things to live well. So we have management of the chronic condition on one side and then making sure that quality of life is considered on the other. Uh, and this idea um, leads to a concept called balanced integration. And that's something that's in the pediatric asthma literature where we're really trying to balance the medical man management with the other stresses and demands of life. And I think we also have to add in there the pleasurable activities because it's not all about stresses and demands. We really want to figure out how we can live our best life. So to me, food allergy really creates um, the perfect opportunity for anxiety to thrive. So as I mentioned, there are shared symptoms between anxiety and reactions. And we know that managing a food allergy means that people have to be constantly vigilant. They can't take their eye off the prize. They need to be monitoring that. There's a lot of uncertainty, so about when a threat may or may not be present, and anxiety loves uncertainty, it thrives on it. And then we also know there are significant consequences if a reaction is to occur. So if we have high attention to the situation, decreased predictability or certainty, plus significant risk, then we know that's going to lead to increased anxiety. 
So what can we do for your child or your youth who's experiencing anxiety? First of all, we really want to think about what do we need to teach children. So first off, we need to make sure they have an accurate understanding about their food allergy and how to manage it. We want to think about that as being a gradual process that's developing over time. So maybe it starts with having your young child order their food in a restaurant after you've already talked about what they're going to have, but they're able to tell the waitress what that is, and perhaps they can ask one question with you being able to be in the background to make sure the information that's being obtained is safe and accurate. But we're giving them opportunities to develop some of those skills. We also, again, want to make sure that we're asking open-ended questions and that we're collecting information. So you don't necessarily have to know the answers to all the questions. Sometimes it's helpful to collect the questions, write them down, and then the next time you go for your medical appointment, encourage the child to ask those questions because that's also a skill that's helpful for them to develop in terms of interacting with their healthcare providers. We want to teach problem solving, um, and so one of the acronyms that I like is called the IDEAL method. So each of the letters stand for something. You'll notice in psychology we really love acronyms. Um, the I is for identifying the problem, then D is defining all the parts of the problem and also the goals for the outcome. Then you would explore all the possible solutions, even the ones that you know you're not going to do, that you put them out there just so you've kind of covered all your bases. Then you're going to act by choosing what's the best possible solution from the ones that you've come up with. And then you want to reflect, look back, look at the outcome. If it didn't turn out the way that you want, then you're going to go back to your list, figure out another option, try it again. And this can happen a number of times um, to work towards the goal that you're looking for. We also want to talk about coping strategies with our kids and teach those. Um, so things like doing relaxation, teaching diaphragmatic breathing, really helping children to be aware of the importance of taking a slow, deep breath in through their nose, all the way into their stomach, into their diaphragm, and then slowly letting that breath out through their mouth. Again, you can talk to your kids about their self-talk, so the thing that I was mentioning before in terms of unhelpful, unrealistic thoughts, and whether or not we can change those into things that are more helpful. We can also help kids to identify what their triggers of anxiety are. What are the things that they find stressful? What are the things that bring out that physiological response for them? And can we do any problem solving to try and decrease those or perhaps take some of those situations away altogether? Also, scaffolding is important. Um, so scaffolding is like a ladder, or if, or if you think of a construction site, um, the supports that are put in place in order for people to go higher. So we want to have the involvement in tasks as a stepwise kind of thing. So we're teaching skills in a developmentally appropriate way so that we can build confidence, it's less scary and overwhelming, um, and that's for the child and for the parent as well because we're not giving them all the responsibility at once. It's empowering, it's not abrupt, and really I would encourage you to think about transitioning care. So that's a process over time rather than a transfer of care where all of a sudden the tasks are the child's or the youth's own and we're completely independent from them. That's not uh, the preferred way for it to work. We want to decrease reassurance and important here is in brackets if it's driven by anxiety. So we know that anxiety loves uncertainty and thrives on reassurance. So in the short term, reassurance decreases anxiety and helps someone to feel better. But the next time they feel anxious, what that means is that they need to go and get the reassurance again. So if a child is asking a question to get information, like, is it safe for me to eat this? Or did you look at the label? Is it okay for me to have it? That is important and very appropriate. If a child is asking those kinds of questions over and over and over again, and you've already given the information, they're not seeking information anymore. They're doing something in order to decrease, decrease their anxiety. So it's really important to look at what is the function of the reassurance. We talked about teaching some coping strategies, uh, and I'll give you some resources at the end so you can get some more information about how to access some of those coping strategies. But in addition to teaching, we really want to practice 
and encourage them. So practice is important because it's easier to do things uh, and it's going to be more effective if we practice them when we're not stressed so that when we are in a stress-inducing situation, it's easier for us to use them. So that practice is really important. So again, breathing and relaxation, doing some problem solving, looking at our thoughts, all of those things can be helpful. And then we want to look at how do we coach our children so safely in italics uh, to face their fears so that they're doing things that are important to get them um, engaged in activities that are valued and appropriate, but we're doing it in a very safe way. So uh, it's a step by step kind of uh, process where we're slowly doing things that have previously been avoided and really you're coaching them to do that. Um, we're not talking about inducing fear, we're really talking about helping people to be vigilant because that's important in terms of safety. Also remembering take care of yourself, so we want to make sure that we're doing things um, to reduce our own stress and anxiety because children pick up on that. If we're feeling anxious then they tend to know something's going on um, and parental anxiety can be related very much to uh, children's anxiety. We want to model coping for them, so when we're doing something for ourselves, when we're doing something to help ourselves feel better, then it's good to kind of describe that and help them know what it is and that you're doing that. And then we also want to be on the lookout and figure out when there might be more support that's needed. And so you can um, reach out and get that support. So back to this graphic that we had a few minutes ago. And if we look at the far right, we're talking about the really um, high stress, high anxiety, impairment in function, um, distress group of uh, people on the bell curve here. So that is probably going to come across as looking like avoiding activities or not doing things quite the way that they used to or being very distressed while they're doing them. So for children, big indicator is school refusal. So that might look like not wanting to go to school in the morning, but it might also come across as phone calls from schools about headaches and stomach aches and they're having a hard time kind of staying there. Also keep an eye on whether your child is avoiding activities away from home um, or if they're pretty resistant to doing things if you're not nearby. So if they do ballet and it drop off used to be fine and you could run some errands, but all of a sudden they need you to be there the whole time and they're quite distressed if you talk about leaving, then what's that difference about and what's going on? Children tell us lots of things through their behavior, and so we really have to be kind of detectives and keep an eye on things. So you'll notice in italics here, I have the word excessive a few times, and so we're not talking about stopping doing these things, but we're trying to figure out how frequently are they happening and what is the function, why are they happening? So if there's excessive questions about food contents and about label reading that's beyond what's needed for safety, then I would be considering that reassurance seeking and that's more anxiety driven. Look at how much is being eaten. So it's an appetite kind of question, but also what is being eaten. So is there a significant restriction in a child's diet and where are they eating it? So if the lunch is always coming home from school and it hasn't been touched, or if they go to spend a day with a grandparent and they're not eating the whole day, I would be wanting to know what's that about. Hand washing can be important uh, because sometimes children will do that excessively in order to um, make sure that they're avoiding any allergen on their hands. And so when that's the case, we have to kind of sit down and figure out some rules within the family for hand washing. So the things that I tend to think about are we wash our hands before we eat, we wash our hands after we go to the bathroom, we wash our hands after we touch animals, and we wash our hands if they're dirty or visibly soiled. Beyond that, it can become excessive and certainly if children's hands are becoming red and raw and sore that's a sign that there's too much hand washing going on. Look at your child's sleep. Um, so is your child having a hard time falling asleep? This is different than it used to be or they can't fall asleep unless you're in the room all of a sudden or they're waking up a lot through the night. Those kinds of things can give us a good idea that maybe there's something else going on. And also keeping an idea, uh, sorry, keeping an eye on their mood. So what are they like day to day? And for children and youth, often um, that comes across more as irritability than it does sadness. So just to keep our eye out for that. We want to be checking in again with peer relationships. And if you um, have the sense that there's been some challenges with peers, there's been bullying, there's been isolation, and it's feeling like you need some more support um, than what you can offer within the family, then reaching out can be helpful. 
sometimes um, children and youth need support to work on advocating for themselves. So if they have a hard time asking questions at school in relation to the food ingredients or at restaurants, uh, or if they have a hard time turning down unsafe foods because they don't want to do something that they feel might offend other people, then we really have to see if there's any social anxiety that's causing challenges um, and if we can do any kind of role play and problem solving and practice to help people develop those skills. Keep an eye on um, your own coping and if you're not uh, doing as well as you would like to be, if it's interfering, if it's causing problems um, at work, at home, in relationships, then that's important um, to assess. And then for your other children, again, looking at their behavior. So has there been a change in sleep or appetite or mood? Are they not doing things they used to do or doing things the same way they used to do them? Certainly, um, again, behavior is a really big indicator for kids. They don't always tell us I'm having a hard time, but we can pick it up other ways. And then sometimes uh, psychologists can also be helpful when a family is looking at doing a food challenge and that can be extremely stressful. And so if there's decision making that needs to be done around that or support to prepare for it, then a referral to psychology might be a helpful thing to consider. On the other side, um, we have the risk taking kind of behaviors. And so, again, this is where there's not a lot of anxiety and it can result in more frequent reactions because um, there is risk taking. So often um, this is identified when there's conflict between a youth and the parent. So there's uh, added stress and added frustration within that relationship. And then if there are um, examples where non-adherence is happening or risk-taking behavior, then having an outside person to assist with that can be beneficial to consider. And really, you know your child best. Um, so if you're feeling like something's different and you're feeling concerned, then it can be really helpful to talk to a professional in order to get an objective assessment um, and either get the sense of, nope, this is within what we would expect, and you get some reassurance about that, or for someone to say, yeah, okay, maybe there's some things here that we should work on, and let's kind of figure out what some of those goals would be and how we can work towards that. So where do you go if you're feeling like more support is indicated? Uh, your family doctor or your pediatrician, your allergist are all wonderful resources, resources um, and can have ideas in terms of people or places that might be appropriate. Uh, check with your work. Uh, employee assistance programs are often available. School is a great resource. Uh, sometimes there are clinicians right in the school that can be helpful or guidance counselors that can help, um, but also teachers give great information in terms of how your child is doing and if there's been behavioral changes they've noticed so that we get more information. Uh, and then there's psychology, which is the lens that I'm coming from. So our goals, if we're treating someone for anxiety, are to decrease their distress and impairment. We want to work to improve their functioning. We want to get back to things that are important for the family. And then we really want to, in the long term, um, look at ways to build confidence and resilience and have people build um, for future success and have those tools. So I think about it as improving anxiety management or improving coping, but I will never talk about taking anxiety completely away. Um, it's not realistic and it's important for people to know that we need anxiety and especially in food allergy, we need people to be vigilant about things. Um, but it's also, it's not helpful. So we can't do it, it's not helpful, it's not a realistic goal. And so let's figure out how we can feel like we're able to manage it better. So um, cognitive behavioral therapy is the way that we typically approach this when we're doing uh, psychological intervention. Um, and I could spend an hour talking about CBT, so I'm giving you the Coles Notes version over a couple of slides. But the idea is that we are looking at the relationships between our thoughts, that's the cognitive part, uh, our emotions, our physical sensations, and our actions, the behaviors, and then looking at changing unhelpful thoughts and behaviors so that we can work towards specific goals and changes. And all of these relationships are bi-directional, so thoughts impact behavior and behavior impacts thoughts and all of the other things uh, throughout the triangle would be related to the same way. 
Um, it is a evidence-based form of psychotherapy. It's short term, so we're looking at usually four to six-ish sessions. We're focusing on what's happening now and setting very present-oriented goals. Again, focusing on thoughts and behaviors. And there's a lot of research. This is very um, well researched, very evidence-based, especially for anxiety and uh, mood or depression. So uh, working on helpful thoughts and developing more realistic ones, not positive, realistic, looking at increasing relaxation strategies and problem solving and facing fears is a big thing we do with anxiety. So behavioral exposure, it's called, and getting people to slowly do the things they've been avoiding. And then helping people to um, identify their emotions and what different feelings are like in their body so that they have that awareness. So to give you some resources, um, in terms of general anxiety, these are two books I really like. One is Keys to Parenting Your Anxious Child um, from a psychiatrist in Toronto. And the other one is um, from Ronald Rappé, and I believe they're an Australian group. Uh, both are available at Chapters Indigo and public libraries. Anxiety Canada is a wonderful website that I cannot say enough about. Lots of information, lots of resources, um, and it's free. So I would strongly encourage you to look at that. That's anxietycanada.com. A couple of apps, especially for older children and teens and parents. MindShift comes from Anxiety Canada and Headspace is another one um, that gives uh, strategies for mindfulness, for relaxation um, and breathing. Online, lots of great things. So certainly Food Allergy Canada has lots of great resources, Allergic Living um, and FAIR, which is Food Allergy Research and Education. I know I'm going through these rather quickly, but for the sake of time, we want to leave an opportunity for questions. I'm uh, going to give a shout out about Camp Triumph, which is a camp that's in Prince Edward Island for siblings um, specifically. So for children who have been impacted by a sibling or parent who has a serious chronic illness, it's free for children to attend, but you do need to get your child to Prince Edward Island. A beautiful spot to visit. So I'll just put a plug in there. Um, in terms of psychology, so if you go to the Canadian Psychological Association, that's our parent body, they have a listing of all the provinces and territories where you can actually click and figure out who's available in your area that you could seek um, psychological support from. So again, Canadian Psychological Association. Uh, there's a food allergy counselor directory that I've only recently become aware of. Uh, Tamara Hubbard reached out and gave me this information. She's developed this resource where there's a listing of individuals who identify as having food allergy as one of their specialties. Right now, it's primarily American clinicians, but they're hoping to add Canadian ones as well. And then look at your uh, local community health clinics. So ideally, you want someone who has experience um, treating food allergy, but that's pretty uncommon or it's certainly less common. So it's looking for someone who has experience with children, uh, who has done some health or medical kind of psychology, and then essential that they have experience treating anxiety. Want to make sure people know there are positives too. So we know that chronic illness um, certainly has challenges, but we know that it can increase people's self-efficacy and their leadership and their uh, strength of personality. There's some research that shows us in food allergies that families can be more cohesive as a result of the food allergy. And across the broader chronic illness literature, many strengths um, are reported for siblings relative to their peers in terms of advocacy and empathy and being able to be uh, leaders. Finally, there is literature about resilience and post-traumatic growth. So people hear about uh, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but we also have post-traumatic growth where there can be um, positive psychological changes that come from very challenging events. So things like changes in personal behavior, uh, more meaningful relationships, greater appreciation of life. So positive things that can come from something that's really challenging. So hopefully um, what you have gotten from my discussion today is a recognition that food allergy can be really stressful and it can negatively um, impact not only the diagnosed child, but also other members of the family. So we really wanna keep an eye on everyone. Some degree of anxiety is expected and it can be helpful to safely manage food allergy. So really wanna normalize that anxiety but we may have to make sure there's a balance. So it's uh, making sure that we're safely managing the food allergy, but also living the best life. 
And then finally, when there are challenges with coping or functioning that are identified, there are resources that can be accessed, there are people that can help, and so it's important to recognize that and reach out. And now I think we have some questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gillespie, for the very, very informative presentation and the great resources at the end as well. Those I'm sure will be really helpful. We did get a lot of questions um, through the registration as well as the presentation. We'll go through some now. Um, this parent had asked, how do I articulate EpiPens can save my son's life without overwhelming him with fear of death? He already worries about dying. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a very important question. And again, it's all about balance because we wanna make sure that the risk is emphasized, but not in such a way that it's going to induce fear, which is not gonna be as productive. So I think it's about presenting the information to the child calmly, because as I mentioned, um, kids really pick up on our fear. So if we're anxious having the discussion, then they're going to pick up on that. Um, we do want to talk about the seriousness of the reaction um, and the importance of having an EpiPen available, but we want to make sure that we can emphasize what can be done. And so we're looking at that control piece and there's things that are manageable. Um, depending on the child's age, it's really looking at your language and making sure that we're not saying things that are going to um, make them so fearful or cause them to panic that they miss the message that you're giving. And then um, looking for opportunities to ask questions. So what kind of information do they have? And again, this is a conversation that probably happens multiple times. It's not just a one-off. Um, and thinking about other things that can be done to increase their confidence. So a training kit, for example, is that something that could be helpful or other information that the young child would benefit from? Okay, that's great. We have a few questions uh, sibling related. Um, the first is, how to decrease food anxiety for my non-allergic child who's witnessed anaphylaxis in her brother? Yes, so that would be a very stressful situation for sure. And so I think we want to make sure that we're reassuring all of the children um, that uh, the affected child is okay. And also validating how scary that was because we don't want to lose sight of that. Um, we want to keep an eye on that child uh, in terms of them developing any symptoms of trauma. So we're looking for changes in their behavior that lingers and working to really return the household back to routine as much as possible. Because um, as we talked about earlier, that consistency and routine and rules, that's what children thrive on. So it gives a sense of, okay, things are back to normal. It's going to be okay. Uh, and then also we want to reinforce what went well. So it was very serious and it was very scary, but there were lots of things that led to the best possible outcome. So the symptoms were identified quickly. Um, there was the use of the EpiPen, the doctors and nurses at the hospital were helpful. So again, hopefully we're giving some empowerment to the child instead of just fear. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Um, another question was if you could provide coping strategies and how to mitigate resentment with older non-allergic siblings. Yeah, so hopefully um, some of that came across when I was talking about siblings, but really it's that communication uh, piece. So talking about why the child is feeling resentful without um, being defensive yourself, because um, we just we want to understand it and not uh, be angry about it. Validate those feelings um, and then think about other opportunities for one-on-one -on -one time where you can really recognize unique things about the sibling and make sure that they're getting your time and your attention as well. Um, we want to try and have similar expectations across the household because if one child has to do some things the other child doesn't and it doesn't seem fair then that can lead to resentment. Um, emphasizing the idea and, and remembering too as a parent that that resentment is about the food allergy not the child um, him or herself so if there's a way to externalize that and talk about the food allergy um, instead of just you know you're angry at your brother and sister when really you're angry about some of the things the food allergy makes different in our household. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a kind of an interesting question. Um, is trauma treatment after an anaphylactic reaction recommended? 
that's a great uh, question because certainly any kind of anaphylaxis is going to be extremely traumatic for everybody. Um, it's not necessarily recommended, so it, it depends. And so it's important that people are aware that there is a risk of that. And there's a small bit of literature that talks about um, post-traumatic stress disorder in adults and a very small group of children um, when there was anaphylaxis. So it's possible, but there's many people who experience trauma, broadly speaking, that don't go on to develop PTSD, so we can't assume. So I think, again, that idea of reassuring that everything is now okay, that we're doing things um, to keep you safe, and getting back to routine, routine and predictability is important. Um, if there's things that are being avoided, we want to encourage that child going back to those things in a safe kind of way. Um, and when I say avoided, I don't mean the food allergens, obviously, it's kind of activities or places. Um, but then we really want to keep an eye on their behavior. And so we know for um, any kind of post-traumatic stress, there are changes in behavior that happens. Uh, sometimes they're right after the event, and sometimes they're many months or even years later. So just to kind of be aware of it and keep an eye on it. So we're looking um, at changes in um, behavior, sorry, changes in mood. So um, being more negative or not being as interested in activities. Um, if they're experiencing unwanted memories, they're very upset. There's nightmares or flashbacks as if they're reliving what's happened, even though they're not. Um, if they're doing a lot of avoidance, so avoiding places or avoiding people, that they associate with the event or avoiding even talking about you know the place that it happened or people that were there or talking about the event at all that can be a sign uh, and then finally looking at um, whether or not they seem like they startle more easily if they're um, more physiologically aroused they're on edge changes with eating and sleeping and concentrating those things can all be important to consider in terms of trauma okay that's great uh, we I had a question that just uh, came in. Um, <clears throat> when my child asks me to check labels excessively, is there any useful phrase to say? Yeah, that, excellent. Thank you for asking that. Um, because I know excessively is tricky because it's not like we can say one and done. Uh, maybe for some kids it's two and that's okay. And so it's kind of figuring out for yourself what's going to be the most helpful um, in terms of number of times. But for responses, if we're thinking about reassurance feeding anxiety, if it's anxiety driven, then we want to try and figure out what's the child getting from your reassurance. And so if you telling them it's okay reduces their anxiety, we want to get them to a point where they're able to tell themselves it's okay so that their anxiety can be reduced. So if you've already um, checked the label and you've told them, yep, we've checked it, whatever the allergen is, is not present, it's safe, and they're asking you again, then I would encourage you to kind of um, deflect that back to them. So, oh, we just talked about that. What did mom say? Well, you told me that we read it and there's nothing in it. It's okay. Perfect. Exactly. Because we're actually getting the child to say the words. They're hearing themselves say it and hopefully they're able to internalize that and reassure themselves instead of asking for our reassurance repeatedly. Okay, great. Uh, we have time for about one more question. Um, uh, this parent wanted to know uh, how they can prevent my children from feeling ostracized socially from allergy. Well, ostracized is a very uh, strong word. And so if there are feelings of being um, left out, of, of being excluded, of um, being ostracized, then again, I think we want to have that uh, conversation to learn what's going on for the child. Um, and if there are situations where they are being isolated um, and left out, it's often talking to the adults in the situation because they're setting the stage of what the expectations are and what excuse me, reasonable treatment in relation to the food allergy involves. Um, excuse me, so it's figuring out um, what's going on and then how can we hopefully change adults' behavior with the idea of changing other kids' behavior. Um, but really, again, we wanna try and create the space so they can talk about it. It's really, really hard to hear your child say, um, no one likes me, they're leaving me out. And it, we often jump to, oh, that's not true you're really popular, lots of people like you, or, oh, the kids that are doing that are just being mean, ignore them, they don't matter, when really that can be quite invalidating. So it's um, recognizing that urge in ourselves, and instead of jumping to the fixing it and trying to make your child feel better, it's creating the space to say, it really hurts when people leave you out, and it's so hard when you feel like you don't fit in. Um, so then you can kind of 
understand what's going on and help them to feel heard. Um, and then I would think about, is there a different discussion that needs to happen if it's a child being ostracized at school, then does there need to be a broader discussion with school staff to figure out what kind of education needs to be put in place for the broader population so that people really understand it's not fear, fair um, to treat people that way and to exclude them because of their food allergy. Okay, that's great. Um, the questions that we didn't get to, um, we will do our best to get back to everybody individually. Thanks so much for submitting your questions and thank you so much, Dr. Gillespie, for the um, wonderful answers and uh, the thoughtful responses. Um, please do consider donating to Food Allergy Canada. We are a nationally registered charity and we rely on your donations to provide services for free, like these ongoing educational webinars, to support the community. Um, we'd be grateful for your support. You can just visit foodallergycanada.ca slash donate to learn more about the impact your donations can make. We also want to thank our sponsors for their contributions to our ongoing webinar series. It's Pfizer Canada, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, the Walter Maria Schroeder Foundation, and the Peanut Bureau of Canada. Thank you again for your participation in this webinar. You can view a recording of it uh, on our website shortly. And please also feel free to share with others uh, who may also benefit. And as a reminder, you will get a short survey through GoToWebinar immediately after this webinar that will pop up on your screen. You'll also receive the survey in an email the next hour or so. Please do take a moment to complete it. Your feedback is so crucial uh, to us so we can improve our future webinars and also understand what other topics you might be interested in learning more about. Thank you again. This now concludes the webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.